Good morning to each and one of you once again as we study through the seven churches of Asia Minor. We want to give heed to its message because the same message that was given to each of those seven churches is certainly ones that we are to hear today in our congregation here at Deborah. What if Jesus personally gave us a letter here at Deborah? What would he say to us? Well, as we look through these seven churches, we need to evaluate ourselves and be honest and ask ourselves, are we being the church that Jesus wants us to be? As we studied the church at Sardis, I came across a news story that I got a long time ago, probably over a year ago, because I thought the story that I saw was so out of touch uh, with reality. I didn't think it was actually true. But they actually substantiated evidence that this story was true. They actually even gave a picture. And the picture, that, the story that I found was by a woman by the name of Gert Rizzoli. Gert Rizzoli was a one who went to a congregation, uh, I don't know, a denomination somewhere in Moscow, Idaho for 40 years. She sat on the very front row. She sat there at the same spot for 40 years. And you know what happened to her? She died, but she before she died, she had wished that they would embalm her, bronze her, and put her statue there in that congregation. Now, I want you to think about that. Think about Don right here, statue right there. <laughs> Now, you think about that for a moment. And uh, the church was actually frightened that more people might follow after Gert Rizzoli, that there would be more statues that would come into their congregation. Now, I want you to think about that. Think about a congregation full of statues. Can you believe that? A bunch of dead people. But you know something? There's something that us we need to think about. Even though we're physically alive right now, could not be the case that we are actually a dead church. Because that's what the church at Sardis was told. I know that you have a name that you're alive, but you are dead. Now I want you to think about that and ask yourself, am I dead? Am I dead in trespasses and sins? As Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, have I allowed sin to have dominion over my life again as a Christian? Because you see, we're either for Jesus or we're for the devil. We're either for God or for the world. We cannot love both God and the world. And we're either loving one or the other. And so I want us to ask ourselves, are we a dead church? By valuing the city, what we're going to do is look at the context, of course, of Sardis, look at their geography, their history, and so forth. And then we're going to see how Jesus pulls out all of what they happened in their history and help to, uh, help to understand what this church was going through. And then, of course, to make applications for us. So as we look at the geography first, I want you to think about how, where Sardis was. Of course, if you want to think about it this way, you can think about the seven churches of Asia Minor kind of like a crooked horseshoe. Start at Ephesus, goes all the way, and of course we have just studied from Thyatira last week, and now we're on to the church at Sardis. Now Sardis was about, it says, 60 miles away from the coast, and what was really interesting is that once again we see an inland city, just that we, we saw at the, at the city of Pergamos. Remember Pergamos was set on a high hill, on a high mountain. Well, that's what we see in regards to Sardis. In fact, along the way of Sardis was a river called the Pactolus River. Now, if you ever heard of uh, the character named Mighton, you know, he was a guy who could take a, he had a golden hand. He could, everything he touched uh, could turn into gold. Well, that was really interesting because this is supposedly the river where it occurred and that he made that. Of course, we know that's a myth, but we know that at Sardis was one of the most richest cities in the world. And we'll see that in just a moment. Now, Mount Timolus is where I, the mountain I was talking about where the ancient city of Sardis lied. You can see in front of you, we're going to be talking about the Temple of Artemis where we're standing at right now, but the view you can see of that mountain is where the ancient city was. Now, they, uh, after the ancient city was taken so many times, 
we have to recognize that they actually moved from down off the mountain and into the valley. And this is where they set up these shops. And this is the Byzantine area, era, around 6th century AD. So these are the leftover ruins that we see today. Then we see a, a Jewish synagogue. And there's something really interesting about this Jewish synagogue is that it was, they found that it went back to the 6th century BC. Now that's amazing because you'll remember that what happened to the children of Israel? Well, they were taken into captivity into Babylon. And then we see that Babylon, well, the Persians released them to go back to their homeland, but some actually scattered throughout the whole Mediterranean world. And, of course, some of them came here to Sardis in the 6th century B.C. And obviously a big number of the Jewish population came here because you'll see the size of the synagogue. I mean, look at that. It's amazing to see the mosaics and the designs, and it's just it's a fantastic uh, synagogue to look at. Now, as you look behind the synagogue, you'll actually run into what was a gymnasium where people would work out, people would train for the Olympics, and we see that if you walk through the, what is called the Marble Hall, you would come across to the pool, which is, the left, which is left over. So you can see kind of what this city was like. It was very spectacular. It once had a, it was once very special in history, but now by the time of the book of Revelation, this city wasn't very important anymore. So if you look at the history, let's begin by saying that the, it was the capital of Lydia under Caressus. Now Caressus was a really interesting guy. He was one of the richest man, men in the world. In fact, he had over $600 million of gold because that's what Cyrus took away from him when he conquered him. Now, what's really interesting about Caressus is that you could, you could actually, there was a, this uh, gold dust that was in that Potolus River, and they were able to mine that in, way, in some way, and of course, this is where gold coins were minted first. It's the first place. And so they were able to make so many coins that Caressus didn't know what to do with all this. He was so powerful and rich, and what he want? guess what he wanted? More. He wanted to be more rich. He wanted to be more powerful. He wanted to expand his empire. Well, what did he do? Well, we see what he did was he decided to say, well, let's go attack Cyrus, king of Persia. And this is the same Cyrus you'll find in your Bible in Ezra chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Now, what he did was he decided that he would visit this oracle at Delphi first. And say, should I go up against this guy? And uh, basically, what the the uh, Oracle at Delphi, they were very ambiguous. They said some very vague statements. And supposedly the vague statement that was given to him is that if you go to fight against Cyrus, you the, the you will destroy a great empire. But it, what he didn't realize is he thought that meant he was going to destroy the Persians. But what that actually meant was his empire was going to be destroyed. And that's exactly what happened. He attacked them. He horribly lost. He retreated to Mount Timolus, to the ancient city, and he decided to stay there. And he thought that they could really guard the city. They thought they'd be safe in that city and that no one would try to attack them. And what's really interesting about Sardis was, I mean, around the walls was this area where, I mean, you couldn't really climb up at all. So it seemed very safe and secure. It seemed very impregnable. And Cyrus came to Sardis and said, how are we going to take this city? And they watched for days how they might try to take the city. But what was interesting about the city was there was had to be a way to get in, right? And what we see here is that on one side of the city of Sardis was this very narrow, steep pathway, which they had to get up and go into the city of Sardis. Well, what occurred? Well, when Cyrus came, he, of course, was letting his men watch out. And one of the men finally spotted a Sardinian soldier. He had, his helmet had fallen off. And the Sardinian soldier went through that narrow pathway, got the helmet, came back up through that same area. And the Cyrus soldier said, Ah, Cyrus, we got away. We know where we can go in and attack this city. So they actually went in at night, and there was no watchman guarding the city. That's how overconfident, that's how prideful Caressus was. He thought the city won't be taken. There's no need to have watchmen watching out the city. And what happened? His empire fell because he didn't watch. He wasn't vigilant. 
And so we see that's what happens. Well, a few uh, many years later, it happened a second time. In fact, this time it was Antiochus the third against his cousin, uh, against his son. Uh, sorry, his cousin Achaeus, who was situated in the same area, and the same thing actually happened. One of the helmets of Achaeus' men fell off, went down through that narrow seat pathway, came back. They find, they saw where he had gone, and they said, "Hey, let's." Antioch says, "Let's take the city," and they took it again at night. So, do people learn from their mistakes that they repeat when they have actually heard of what happened to Caressus, Sardis, and how it was captured? But no, people tend to repeat their mistakes. Well, we see that Xerxes the first. Now, do you remember who he was? In the Bible, he's known as Ahasuerus. Do we not remember who, who he was famous for in what book? Well, it's the book that we're studying, right? The book of Esther. That's the one that came, and he said, I'm going to go conquer the Persians, and he gathered all of his army here at that city of Sardis. Well, we see in 17 AD, Sardis went through a big, huge earthquake. It destroyed most of the city, and they had to get funds for five years from the emperor to rebuild it, and it was from the emperor Tiberius. And so that would have cost billions of dollars. Now, like we said, by this time, people were living in the surrounding valley. And what was occurring was uh, basically, you know, like we said, the city, the city was once enjoyed a rich history. But now they weren't that much anymore. They were very unimportant. It seemed that they were actually alive. But in fact, they were dead. Now... That brings us to our his, to our religion of the city. Now, there is a lot of gods that were worshipped in this city. There was Zeus, the chief god of lightning. There was Sabele, who was the go- earth goddess. That was our main god. Uh, there were some others, such as Tiberius. Uh, remember, it was Tiberius who helped them rebuild the city, so they decided to rededicate a temple to him for helping after that earthquake hit in eighty seventeen. And then there was Artemis, Diana. Now that's very interesting uh, because remember that God? We studied it in Ephesians chapter 19. That's the same God that the crowd cries out to. Great is Diana of the Ephesians. They cried out over and over again for two hours. And so they built a temple to, to Artemis. And as you can see, we're walking along from Mount Tamolus, and we're walking toward this temple. And this is the remains of the temple that you'll see because it was destroyed by the earthquake. And I just wanted to give you some idea of what it looked like. And basically you can see just how uh, how big it was. I mean, look at those massive columns. And you can see Mount Tamolus right behind in the second picture of what it once looked like. The reason I talk about this is because there's a lesson that Jesus wants them to learn and wants us to learn because you see this temple wasn't big as the one in Ephesus where it was one of the seven wonders of the world but they started building it in 400 BC but when that earthquake hit it basically destroyed that temple and they tried to rebuild it but they never finished they started it but they never finished it now is there a great lesson for us for that we'll see in a moment So in Revelation 3, verse 1, Jesus says to them, And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Jesus, what are you trying to say? Who has the seven spirits of God? What's Jesus trying to say? Well, Jesus is trying to say is that he has a close relationship, association with the Holy Spirit. In Matthew chapter 3, Remember what occurred when John the Immerser baptized him? Well, it says the spirit, the, the clouds, they tore apart, and he saw the heavens, and he, of course the spirit came like a dove and ascended upon Christ. And it heard a voice from heaven, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And so we see how the Holy Spirit came upon Jesus, because that's what Jesus says in Luke 4. He says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. So we see this close association because Jesus would send the Holy Spirit and that he would guide the apostles into all truth. 
And that's why we have the words of God. Well, Jesus, who has the seven spirits of God, the word seven in Hebrew means complete, perfect. And that's what God is. He is perfect. So it's Jesus who has a close association with the Holy Spirit. And Jesus is the one who holds the seven stars. Well, if you look at it back in Revelation chapter 1, verse 20, the seven stars are the seven angels of the seven churches. I probably better translate the seven messengers. Jesus gave authority to those messengers to read God's word because the letters that are written are his message. And that's what we need to remember. This is something that Jesus has for each and every one of us to think about. And so we want to look at the evaluation of the church. And firstly, I want us to think about the reality of Sardis situation, but compare that to our reality. You know, people are really good at fooling themselves, aren't they? Are we really good at sometimes deceiving ourselves? Does not the scripture say a lot, don't deceive yourself? It does. It says it over and over again. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren, James would write. And yet, that's what sadly we do. So many times we deceive ourselves. We lie to ourselves. And you can't help but think about a mirror. You know, when we get up in the morning, right before we go to the work, maybe after we got into the shower, we get out and we recognize we need to comb our hair, we need to brush our teeth, we need to make ourselves look good, right? Because there's going to be some blemishes on us. And we need to make ourselves look good. But sometimes when people look into the mirror and they see those blemishes and they say, yeah, I'm okay, I'm all right. And they forget who they really are, don't they? Well, that's what happens to the church of Sardis. And that's what can happen to us when we forget who we are. And that's why we find in James 1, verse 22, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror, for he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. So you're blessed if you're not just a hearer, but a doer of the, of the word of God. And that's what we need to remember. Not just to hear, but to put it into practice. Not to look in the mirror and say, ah, you know, I'm okay. I'm all right. Because that's sadly what we usually do with ourselves. Let me give you a situation where we might think about that. This is sadly what happened to the church at Sardis. I mean, Jesus says to them, I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are in fact dead. That's what had happened to their city. It was once a known city. But now it's not that very important anymore. Here we have the church at Sardis. They were known to be alive at one point. They thought they were still alive, but they were actually not. Are we a dead church or are we living? You have to ask, honestly ask yourself that question. As the Bible would say, for if anyone thinks himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. You know how sadly when this comes into play? It's when we think of big sins and little sins, don't we? Oh, I'm not like them. And we compare ourselves to someone in the congregation. I'm not like them. They're worser than I am. You know what? We should not compare ourselves to others. It is very unwise to do so. Because the Bible says this, For we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. Brethren, we need to learn that sin is sin, no matter what it is. And, you know, I think about sometimes, you know, the tendency, well, we're not like abortion clinics. We're not murdering millions of babies. Or we're not like terrorist groups. We're not going out committing violence against people. Or we're not like homosexuals. We're committing this grievous sin. But, brethren, sin is sin. If I'm tail-bearing, if I'm saying something against my brother and gossiping about him, it is still sin. And if I'm forsaking the assembly of God, that is still sin. We need to recognize that and because we're deceiving ourselves, we're not. And we are being dead if we're not. And that's something for us to really think about. So are we willing to really look into ourselves and say, am I dead or am I alive? Because we're one or the other. You know, remember how Jesus told that parable? 
of the tax collector and the Pharisee. So two men went up into the temple to pray. Remember what the Pharisee said? He said, Lord, I'm not like other men. You know, I don't, I'm, no, I'm not unjust. I'm not an extortioner. I'm not an adulterer. I'm not even like that tax collector over there. Oh, I'm better. I'm very better than he compared to him. But then there's the tax collector standing afar off, not even wanting to look up into heaven. God, be merciful to me, the sinner. And what does he do? Which one was justified? Who was justified by God in his, in his sight? You know, we might think, well, that Pharisee, he's a very religious person, right? But it is in fact the tax collector who is the one that was justified by God. We should not compare ourselves to others. Well, we see how the church is also evaluated in their readiness. Listen very closely to what it said. You know, we think about sometimes being ready. You know, maybe if there's, uh, think back in medieval times when an army would go against a castle and we get watchmen to set up, archers to set up, and get ready to go to battle, right? Well, let's read what Jesus says. He says, be watchful. Now, what happened in their history of Sardis? Do you remember? They were captured two times because they didn't have any watchmen watching out for that city. They were not being vigilant. And that's sadly what happens to us when we're not watching out and we let Satan come into that steep pathway and he overtakes us. The Bible says, be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking him he may devour. And we are being devoured if we're allowing him into our lives. We are sadly dead. We are dead, we are dead people. And that's why, sadly, I think some of us might be overconfident and arrogant sometimes. 1 Corinthians 10, 12, 12 says, Take heed, lest you fall. We need to be careful. Well, we see how the church also was needed to have a renewal in their lives toward God. So that's why Jesus says, Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. Do you sometimes have a fickle faith? I know I sometimes do, and I don't mean to. But we sometimes let our faith fade. We let it get, we let it go, grow weak. And the reason why is we don't put into practice what we're supposed to be doing as Christians. And I think about a lot when we talk about what the disciples asked Jesus. Remember what they said? They demanded, increase our faith. Well, how has faith increased? So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Applying the Word of God to our very souls, to our very lives, will help strengthen our faith. And it will not have to be fickle. We can strengthen the things which remain and put to death the things that need to die. Because that's what we need to recognize when we became Christians. We are to die to sin. But some of us have not let some sins die. We let them remain. We need to cut them off. Galatians 2 verse 20 talks about, I have been crucified with Christ. It means that at one point I was crucified and I remained crucified. I was put to death. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, it's not me, but Christ who lives in me and the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Do you recognize that you can actually die to your sins if you're willing to show renewal in your life that you want to do what's right? That will keep us from being a dead church. But we also see reconstruction taking place. We've all seen buildings that have gone into disrepair and seen people work on it to repair a house. In fact, right down the road is a person. There's a house that was for sale for a while, and there's a some people who moved in and they've been repairing that old house. And it looks really much better than it was before. Well, we think about how sadly the church sometimes needs some reconstruction. It falls down. And I think about in this in regards to what Jesus says to the church at Sardis because there was something in their history that occurred not too long ago. Since this letter was written for AD 70, remember in AD 17, an earthquake hit and it destroyed that temple of Artemis. 
They had the money to rebuild that temple, but they didn't do so. They didn't start. They didn't start what they finished. Well, it's the same thing with the temple of God, the temple of the living God that we need to keep on building. We need to stand strong in, keep on building up. But sadly, we let it go into disrepair. We need to have some reconstruction in our lives, don't we? You know, you can't help but think about what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 9 10. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. You know, we recognize that this congregation started here at Deborah a, long, a little while ago, didn't it? Yeah. Is it in need of re- spiritual repair? For some of us, that may be the case to help build it back to what it needs to be. Are we doing that? Are we giving our glory to God? Well, we see fifth and sixth thing that Jesus states to them is to remember and repent. You know, if you're out remembering, you can't help but think about the prodigal son went out, wasted his inheritance, went out to a far country, and he went and he sadly he got himself into such a, a wasteful life. But he came to himself, it says in Luke 15, verse 17. He remembered the blessings of his father's house. He remembered the goodness of his father. Maybe some of us need to recognize that God's forbearance, his patience, should lead us to repentance. God is not willing that any should perish, but for all to come to repentance. Why is God allowing this world to continue? He's being patient with it. But there will be a day in which He will judge the world in righteousness, and He will judge each and every one of us. He will evaluate us, and He will say, Have you been living for me? Have you been doing what is right? Have you been trying to reach out to others? Have you tried to help those who are in need? Something that for us to really think about. That's why he says, remember, therefore, how you have received and heard, especially when we first heard the gospel and received into our heart and obeyed it. That's something we need to think about. Hold fast and repent. Allow godly sorrow because that should that breaks God's heart when we sin and should want us to and seek ter- his forgiveness on his terms. In which he would say, therefore, if you will not watch... If you will not watch like the city of Sardis once did, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. And then he asked them if they are being reliable, if they are trustworthy. And in fact, there were a few who were being faithful to God. The Bible says this, You have a few names, even Sardis, who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy you know, when we obey the gospel of Christ, we are made white. We don't have dark blots of sin and blemishes. But it may be the case that for us, after we become Christians, that we live lives of sin and we let those blemishes continue and we're not even looking for those dark blots. Oh, how we, just as I am, without one plea, that thought His blood was shed for me And that there's this one dark blot that I need to recognize that I need to get rid of in my life. We can do that if we're willing to repent. Are we being reliable? Are we being trustworthy? Are we being faithful to God? Because Jesus says there's just going to be a few who walk through the narrow gate, but there is broad the way that leads to destruction, and many go in by it. That really is just her, the reward of what Jesus says. He says, He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments. And I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Have you ever looked up somebody in the phone book and you tried to find their name, but they weren't there anymore? You know, you might think that uh, my, my parents said this. They actually once had a landline, but since they had cell phones, they decided to take off the landline so their names are no longer in that phone book anymore. But you know, there's something more infinitely important than a phone book. 
and that is the book of life. You know, we sing the song, My name is in the book of life. Oh, bless the name of Jesus. I rise above all doubt and strife and see that my title is clear. Is our name really in the book of life? Is your name in the book of life? Is it written down there? Because it either is or it's not. Those who are written down in the book of life will get to enjoy the pleasures of God's eternal presence. While sadly those who are not in his book, what will happen to them? They will be cast into hell fire. You know, that's either the case. I want us to think about if we're in category number one or category number two, I want you to think about this. Are we dead or alive? We're either in dead and trespasses or sin. Are we alive in God? We are living in His presence. We're doing what is His will. We are living faithful towards Him. But friend, we're either one or the other. We cannot be neutral. We either are arrogant and overconfident like Caressus. We either don't see our sin. Or maybe we're actually saying that I'm going to be humble and say I need God in my life. I need to be watchful. I need to be sober and be vigilant because the enemy of the devil is trying to destroy us. He's trying to destroy your life and mine. Am I being unprepared or am I being prepared? What if Jesus were to come in a few minutes? Would you be prepared to meet him? It's up to us. Jesus gave many parables on people who were unprepared versus those who were prepared. Because heaven, it's a prepared place for a prepared people. Are you prepared to meet God in judgment? It's something that each and every one of us has to evaluate. Am I dead or alive? Am I being overconfident and prideful or am I being watchful? Blessed is the servant who is faithful and is found watching because he will receive his reward from God. Maybe it's the case that you're here this morning and you recognize in your life that it's not been right. You recognize you've been dead. Please, I beg of you, it's nothing wrong with doing what is right. There's nothing wrong with doing what the will of God. And if you'll come down the aisle, come and say, I need to have repentance and prayer. I need to change my life. I don't want to be a dead member. I want to be alive in Christ and do His will. Or maybe you've never even begun your journey in Jesus Christ. You recognize that you believe that He is the Son of God, willing to repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, and be immersed for the remission of your sins. Will you do so? While together we stand, sing the invitation song.